Hey, good afternoon, everyone. We are live on here for last day's boot camp, and we are excited to answer some of your questions regarding end times in the last last days and what the Bible has to say about that. And we've enjoyed this series. Uh, over the last three weeks. I've enjoyed actually teaching it. It's a, a subject that I enjoy uh, because of the sense of urgency I have about the time and the, uh, the era that we're living in and the need for <clears throat> all of us to have a perspective, an eternal perspective on those things. And so we're gonna take as many questions as we can over the next 30 or 40 minutes here. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start because we've got a few questions already in the hopper here that uh, some people jumped on early and the question that i'm going to start with is what would you say is a reasonable expectation for us to have in our lifetime for further signs to come since technology is continuing to grow what would be the next sign for us to look for uh if you watch the message this last week which was called the, uh, the, the two game changer signs. We talked about the two, I believe, are the two most significant signs of our generation. One is the restoration of the nation of Israel. The other is the proliferation and the acceleration of technology. Uh, I think what we should reasonably expect in our lifetime, probably, and I don't know this for a fact, this is just projection, but uh, the next five years or so, let's just call it three to five years and even beyond that, is not so much different uh, birth pangs. Remember in Matthew 24, Jesus talked about these things being birth pangs, wars, rumors of wars, spiritual deception, nation rising against nation, ethnic group against ethnic group, um, false Christ, false prophets, signs in the heavens, signs on the earth, famines, pestilence, earthquakes. All of those things are both spiritual and natural birth pangs of creation and, uh, and cultures responding to the, uh, the implications of sin and the rise of lawlessness in our era. So what I would say is I would expect very similar things, but an intensification of those things as those contractions like a woman who's give, about to give birth the contractions get closer together and they get uh, more intense. So I think we're going to see an intensification. I think we're already beginning to see that. I think it's going to increase. Um, if you pay attention to things globally, there's a lot that's happening in the nations of the world. We have to be so careful. Also, I think this is important to say, uh, we have to be so careful that we don't only view the prophetic scriptures through the lens of America because most of what is in biblical prophecy in fact almost all if if not all is doesn't has nothing to do with America because Bible prophecy is Israel centric it is about God fulfilling his purposes with Israel and then the implications of that impacting the rest of the nations of the world so uh, I don't really see anything in biblical prophecy that speaks specifically to America. So we have to be careful as Americans that we don't look too much into that, which also means we have to pay attention to what's going on in the nations of the world and specifically in the Middle East and Israel. Now, pertaining technology, I think there's some interesting things happening in China right now. Uh, Forbes magazine, Time magazine, and some other business, ESQ magazine, have done full spread articles on China's surveillance state uh, where they are utilizing algorithms, artificial intelligence, and multiple, like millions of surveillance cameras across their country to develop uh, not credit scores, but social behavior scores or social credit scores. And so basically through your phone, through millions of surveillance cameras, Artificial intelligence is monitoring people's behavior and assigning to them a score, whether you're a good citizen or a bad score, if you're a bad citizen, and the privileges and the rights that you have in that country to travel, to own homes, to uh, rent property, to apply for jobs is all based on your social credit score. I think pay attention to that because things like artificial intelligence, 
facial recognition, virtual reality. Uh, many of you may have just seen that Facebook is changing their larger uh, name to Meta. That's all in preparation for the internet really becoming a virtual reality environment. I think these type of things, as I said on Sunday, are great tools that can be used, but they are the acceleration of a lot of things that the Bible talks about. Like in Revelation 13, when it talks about the Antichrist or the beast, the two beasts, false prophets and the Antichrist, that uh, the mark of the beast, as well as the ability for uh, people to be limited in their capacity to buy and sell unless they've received the mark, which is associated with worship of the beast, and the signs and the wonders and the ability to create an actual image of the beast or to breathe life into the beast uh, are all things that would have been very, very uh, uh, appropriate descriptions from a first century person who has no concept of the technological advances we have today trying to describe what they saw prophetically. So we don't know exactly what that will be. There's a lot of conjecture on what that mark, what the mark of the beast will be but what is beyond dispute is that it will have economic and political and cultural implications and so technology will definitely be a part of that so i think we pay attention to those things i don't know what the next sign will be but i will tell you i am keeping my eyes on israel and the conflict with iran right now uh, and also the implications of Iran with all of the rest of the players like Lebanon and Syria and Hamas and the West Bank or Hamas and Gaza. Uh, and all of those serve as surrogates for Persia or Iran. And, uh, and then also uh, paying attention to the Taliban in Afghanistan and just all of the movers and the players and the geopolitical shifting and moving Russia and Syria, they all have a part to play in it. So uh, it's fascinating to keep your eyes on that. Uh, a passage of prophetic scripture to read and to become familiar with is Ezekiel 37, 38. Uh, it talks a lot about the Antichrist's invasion into the Holy Land at some point in the future and to study what those nations are in the modern time. Uh, I'll just give you a hint. Turkey is a big part to play in that. And uh, I would also encourage you to visit, if you want more information, to really dig deeper. There's an organization that we partner with uh, as one of our missions and ministry partners. It's FAI Frontiers Alliance International. They have an app for your smartphone, the FAI app. And on there, they have a lot of Bible studies in the book of Daniel as well as in Ezekiel. Another one on uh, YouTube to follow is uh, a teacher named Joel Richardson. He's a dear friend of mine. He, uh, he has a program called The Underground, and he also has a lot of teaching. He's written several books on the subject. And his belief is that the Antichrist will be Islamic. Uh, and I think there's a lot to be said about that. So uh, hopefully that helps you, Lindsay. I believe that was, or no, that wasn't Lindsay, but whoever asked that question, great question. This one's from Lindsay. What will earth look like after Jesus' return? Will we recognize and uh, be with our families and loved ones, uh, reunited with the ones who have already passed away? Well, the earth will be uh, reconstituted and, uh, and purified of the impacts of sin after Jesus returns. So really, Jesus' return will establish the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ on the earth. And the earth will uh, look different than it does today in that sin will not have its full effect. Righteousness will reign on the earth. At the conclusion of the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth, though, there will be a transition into the eternal age in which the Bible in 2 Peter Isaiah 66 and Revelation 21 talk about the new heavens and the new earth. And that's, that's, uh, that's going to be God uh, reconstituting the universe, the cosmos, and the earth and purging them and preparing them for the eternal state. And so there's two different segments. Now, what's consistent is in the kingdom, whether it's in heaven now or in the kingdom in the future, after the resurrection, Yes, we will absolutely recognize and know our family and others. The Bible says that we know in part now, but 
when, uh, because we're looking through a glass dimly, 1 Corinthians 13, but then we will know as we have been known. We know that others who have already died uh, made appearances to visit Jesus, Moses and Elijah, and they were recognizable. And uh, John recognized Jesus uh, after his resurrection. And so, yes, we will be reunited with our family that were Christians that are in the kingdom. Unfortunately, those who reject Christ, uh, they won't be there. They're not going to be in the kingdom. They're not going to be in the heaven or the new heavens and the new earth. Their destiny is going to be eternal punishment in the lake of fire. And that's, that's a harsh reality, but there's not going to be reuniting that takes place there. There's only isolation and uh, eternal punishment that it's going to take place and that's why it's so important that we pray for our loved ones uh, that's why we witness and share our faith so that they do not perish but they believe on the lord jesus christ and because we want to be reunited with them but heaven's going to be glorious uh, god's going to wipe away every tear it's not going to be any sickness or disease our bodies are going to be resurrected glorified to be like jesus's body and we're going to dwell where heaven and earth are one uh, we're not just going to be floating around singing songs. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. There's going to be new access to God's creation, the universe, I believe. And uh, yes, we will be reunited with those who have already passed. It's going to be a great, great uh, reunion day. Okay, question from Joel, Matthew 24, where Jesus is giving the lesson of the fig tree, Israel. He says that this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Does this mean that our generation will witness his return? I believe that's a great question. I believe what Jesus is saying is that the generation that sees all of these things take place will not pass away until the return of the Lord. Now, some scholars believe that Jesus is speaking specifically about the generation he's speaking to in about 33 AD and connecting that to that generation 40 or 50 years, give or take some, will not pass away until the temple of Jerusalem is destroyed and, uh, and the Jewish people are scattered in all the earth. Kind of the first part of Jesus' uh, teaching on the Olivet Discourse. I don't embrace that. I think what Jesus is clearly saying here in context of the restoration of Israel is that when that, along with... Uh, I. It's complicated, but I think there are some other aspects to the restoration of Israel to the land and the occupying of Jerusalem. Uh, that that gener that generation that sees that happen will not pass away. Now it may be that currently, right now, even though Israel controls the the city of Jerusalem, it's still partitioned east and west Jerusalem. Uh, they've recently moved their capital back to Jerusalem, an American embassy back to Jerusalem. And Temple Mount is very much in dispute. <clears throat> it's very complicated, uh, the geopolitics of it. Jordan, the nation of Jordan actually is the caretaker of the Temple Mount because it's an Islamic holy site. And Israel or Israelis provide the security for it. So it's kind of a, a merger. But what is not allowed is for Jewish people to enter onto the court, the courtyard of Temple Mount and to pray or to worship. That's considered blasphemy by the Muslims. And so recently, you can read about this in the Jerusalem Post, they've allowed some Jewish people to quietly or silently pray on Temple Mount. But that's even in dispute. And there's been a lot over the years of uh, conflict because of their attempt to do that. It may be that the trigger point that kicks off into the, the highly accelerated uh, move towards the return of the Lord will be uh, when the Antichrist figure steps onto the stage and I believe will provide peace in the Middle East, a covenant, Dan Daniel chapter 9, where he establishes a covenant for one, one week or seven years with Israel in which he allows them to either rebuild the temple or to create some sort of a tabernacle or temporary worship space on Temple Mount in which Temple Mount is no longer trampled underfoot by Gentiles. Now, currently it is. 
currently the Temple Mount is trampled under feet because Muslims and non-Muslims uh, have access to it, where in previous times it was a sacred space. So it may be that it's 1967 is the tipping point towards uh, that, and it may be that no, it's going to require that there's actually a temple or a worship environment on Temple Mount, that that generation that sees that happen will not pass away. But what we know is we are definitely inching towards that. And I think it's very possible that we will be a generation that sees many of these things take place and possibly even the return of the Lord. I sure don't want to put a time frame on that. Uh, don't want to be dogmatic about that. It's more of a sense than it is a <clears throat> conviction, but uh, it, it very well could be. Okay, this is a question from Amy. Will there ever come a time where God is satisfied with the amount of people saved on the earth? That's a great question. Um, uh, let me say this. I don't think, I don't think that God's heart is ever going to be satisfied with the reality that some people reject him. Now, that's not to say that God is not fully satisfied within himself, but it's, it's, you know, Peter talks about that, Second Peter talks about that God desires that none should perish. So God's will <clears throat> is that none should perish, meaning he's not satisfied when anybody, uh, you know, goes, goes to hell or is separated from him. But God fully knows those who will accept him and those who will reject him. God may not predetermine you know, there's a school of, of theological thought that believes that the only people that are saved are the people that God unconditionally elects, uh, irresistibly draws to himself, and then supernaturally preserves. I believe the Bible is very clear that man has a part and a, <clears throat> a portion of responsibility in the salvation soteriologically or salvation. We have to believe, but that doesn't mean that God doesn't know. So God knows. God knows the full number of those who are going to accept him by their own free choice. And uh, what we do know is that the Bible is very clear. In Matthew, I believe it, uh, in Matthew it says this, in Matthew 24, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, or all the earth, to every nation, and then the end will come. So when we know that that's one time marker, and, you know, that's huge, that we, we need to know that, we may not know what that number is or who that person is, but God knows every last person who's alive in that generation that will accept him or reject him. And when that last person re receives him, and again, God's not for ordaining that. God's just for knowledge of that. When that happens, I think it's going to be like the days of Noah that the rain is going to begin to fall. <clears throat> now, we can speed. I think we can have an impact on the return of the Lord because Second. Second Peter says uh, that we can pray for and hasten. Where is that verse here? I'm looking in uh, Second Peter. Uh, da, da, da. Do not overlook this fact. So Second Peter three, uh, verse number nine says that God is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That the day of the Lord will not come as a thief and that the heavens will pass away with a roar, with the heavenly bodies will be burned up. Uh, I'm looking for this verse here that says, oh, there it is. Uh, verse number 11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought we to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? So it says that we can actually hasten or speed up the return of the Lord. Well, how do we speed it up? By fulfilling the Great Commission, by getting the gospel out to all nations on the face of the earth so that every person can hear it and have an opportunity to receive it. And God is so patient and long-suffering, he's waiting for that. So um, when that occurs, though, God, is, uh, God will be so fully satisfied that he has given everyone an opportunity and no one will have an excuse. This question is from Abigail. Does Radiant believe in pre, mid, or post-tribulation? 
So here's what Radiant believes. Radiant believes in the physical, visible return of Jesus Christ to the earth. And we that's a closed-handed issue, which means all Christians believe in that. We believe Jesus will return visibly, physically to reign and rule on the earth. There are people in Radiant that believe different viewpoints. Uh, and you don't have to agree with my viewpoint on pre, mid, or post in order to be a part of Radiant Church. Uh, but if you want to be right, you'll agree with me. <laughs> uh, and, and that's a joke. Uh, but my conviction is on post-tribulation. I, I believe that uh, the early church believed in uh, what I believe is historical pre-millennialism, which means Jesus will return at the end of the tribulation, just before his millennial reign of Christ. And this is the apostolic tradition of the church. And I believe the, the New Testament teaches that very clearly. I think that pre-tribulational uh, rapture of the church uh, has no historical bearing. You can't find it anywhere in church history. I believe it's an invention of the last 150 plus years of a man named uh, John Nelson Darby and the Plymouth Brethren and uh, other popular writers like C.I. Schofield and uh, uh, Clarence Larkin and uh, Ryrie <coughs> and some others like that. But if you hold to that conviction of pre-tribulational rapture of the church, uh, that is an open-handed issue, which means you and I can disagree on that and we can... Uh, we can have fellowship together. So, but from a, a standpoint of what Radiant believes, um, and since I'm the, the senior pastor and the primary uh, visionary and communicator, I believe in the post-tribulational uh, uh, catching away of the church prior to the millennial reign of Christ. Okay, this is a question from James. Will babies and young children be taken in the rapture? Well, the rapture, like I just explained, I believe, will take place simultaneously with the return of Jesus. And uh, just like it is spoken of by Paul in Thessalonians here, let's turn over here. Um, it says, now, uh, da, 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 da. talks about the, the catching away of the church and Paul writes in Thessalonians coming of the Lord here we go uh, the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep uh, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet. This is First Thessalonians 4. And the dead in Christ will rise first. So that's the saints that have died whose spirits have been with the Lord. They will return with the Lord, be reunited with their resurrected body first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will then be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. The word meet there is, the, is a Greek word that is used in military Greek uh, of an army that goes out to meet their general before going on to a campaign. So this is the, the rapture of the church or the catching away. The uh, word rapture is not in the Bible, but the Latin Vulgate uses the word rapturo, uh, and that's where we get the word rapture. It means the catching away. And I believe that because young children and babies have not yet reached a place of uh, the ability to re believe or to reject Christ because they don't have an awareness of, of their own sinfulness or their inherent sinfulness, that they are technically, quote, innocent before God and covered uh, by God's grace. Now, some people want to put a strict age of accountability and say, well, when you're 12 years old, well, you can make a case uh, for 12, that's when Jesus was in the temple, you can make a case for 20 because in the wilderness under Moses, it was the generation of those 20 or under 20 years old that were allowed 
to go into the promised land after the 40 year wandering, but anybody 20 years and older were uh, left out. And so people have used that. I don't think there's an exact age. I think every child is different. And uh, when they're able to comprehend sin and their need of a savior and Jesus and his atoning death on the cross, at that point, we become responsible. Uh, but obviously babies and young children uh, fall into that encampment of protected under innocence before God and covered under grace. And so therefore, they are part of the we who are remain, who will then be caught up to meet the Lord. Absolutely. Uh, last question. Who are the 144,000 who are sealed in Revelation chapter 7? Uh, Revelation is a phenomenal book. One of these days, I would love to do a series, just go through all 22 chapters of the book of Revelation. But in the book of Revelation, it lists off 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel that have been sealed by God uh, and are marked as belonging specifically to the Lamb. And it, it's interesting, it talks about them being sealed or actually receiving a mark on their foreheads. It's kind of the, it's the mark of God that the devil tries to imitate by sealing those who are loyal to him. Uh, there's a couple different schools of thought on 144,000, who they are. Some say that uh, the 144,000, 12 is the number of uh, governmental completion. And so uh, 12 times 12 is 144,000 or 12,000 times 12 is 144,000. And this speaks spiritually of the totality of the redeemed whether that be all believers, whether Jew or Gentile, that they are sealed as loyal to the Lamb, and uh, they are sealed by God himself uh, and belong to him. And uh, that it's not specifically just Jewish people or just 144,000. It's a big number that speaks of the totality of God's, of God's people. The other school of thought is that the 144,000 are actually literally 12,000 uh, of the remnant of Jewish believers in the midst of the tribulation from each of the tribes of Israel that God has marked and uh, redeemed to himself and preserved for himself in the midst of the tribulation that they're sealed as belonging to God. And I lean towards that. I believe that uh, the tribulation in that period of time is going to be marked by seeing God move in a very powerful way, not only in the nation of Israel, but among the Jewish people. And I believe God is going to seal uh, uh, 12,000 to himself from every one of the tribes uh, of ancient Israel. Some have said, well, you know, the northern 10 tribes were taken into exile and dispersed and we, how, how can God mark 12,000 for each of the tribes that don't exist anymore? Well, you and I may have lost track of them, but that doesn't mean God has lost track of them. Uh, God's able to uh, track down the genetic descendants of each one of the tribes that are scattered in all the nations. And in fact, in Israel today, you'll find Jewish people from Ethiopia, Somalia, Libya, Spain, uh, India, even the western provinces of China and some of the stands that have been able to, through technology, be able to prove their Jewish ancestry and have been given uh, acknowledgement by the Israeli government that they indeed are Jewish and ancestry is Jewish or Israeli and given citizenship in Israel. So when you go to Israel today, you'll see uh, Ethiopian Jews worshiping right along Sephardic Jews or Ashkenazi Jews, people of Eastern European descent or people from Spanish or people from even Arabian, Arabian uh, descent, but I have Jewish ancestry. So uh, technology can be a big part of that as well as God knows those who belong to him. And so that's who the 144,000 are. Okay, well, we tackled a bunch of questions in 30 minutes. Uh, I wanna thank you guys for connecting with us and asking and uh, tuning in. Hopefully these questions were helpful. And if you like Facebook Live Q&A, uh, shoot us a comment and tell us that and we'll know that whether we should do this again or not. So have a great day, everybody.